Now would you pray with me, please? <clears throat> Loving God, your grace, your love, your power is beyond our grasping and understanding at times. How the smallest of things can have the largest of impacts. And how the largest of ideas can have the smallest effect in our lives. But you, O oh God, are always there. Consistent. Persistent. Always with your arms open, always ready to embrace, always ready to pour yourself into us. And at times we sit there and say, your grace, your power, your love is not enough. Forgive us when we do that. Forgive us when we forget that you are the ones who created the heavens and the earth. That the, that the smallest particle of space dust in the farthest reaches of galaxy is made of the exact same things we find on this earth and find in ourselves. Forgive us of how vast your power is. Forgive us when we can't love someone who has done us wrong. We hold them in contempt. Or the wrong that we have done, we hold ourselves in contempt. Or when you haven't given us what we want and done it our ways that we hold you contempt. Loving God, forgive us of this. Because we don't know what we're doing. We don't know what we're saying. Instead of stopping and focusing on you, we are choosing to follow the self-righteous plan of the world. Forgive us when your grace, your love, your power is not enough. For we know that when we stop and seek your forgiveness, that you, O oh God, stop and hear us. Whether it is forgiveness for ourselves, a need for others, loving God, you hear and you do something. In the timing that is perfect, and in the treatment that is Necessary. We remember Mary Rabina, who will be having back surgery this Tuesday, oh God. And we remember the family of Jim Deke, who, after a four year struggle with cancer, finally let go and entered in your embrace of paradise. We continue to pray for Michelle Stidham's knee recovery and her friend Dave who can't recover from five simultaneous bacterial infections. We remember the family of Sally Hollenbeck and the loss of their loved one. The family of Ken King as they continue to grieve the loss of him. For my wife who is struggling to come to terms with the unexpected passing of her brother. For the needs that weigh heavy on our hearts, both realized and unrealized, O oh God. For future ministries that we are seeking to plant and take off in answering your call. And finding ways, O oh God, to take the faith that we have and without reservation share and live it with those in the world. Just like a missionary. But instead of going to a far corner of our world, we dare to do it with the people who are right, out, right outside our doors. 
Loving God, it is only through your grace, your power, and your love that we are able to do that. It's the only way that we can show our thankfulness in our tithes and offerings in the way that you bless us and we return our first fruits to you in saying, God, take it and use it in accordance to your will. And we do this all because you are a God who is loving and graceful and never, ever gives up. Your plan is still the same. Your focus is still the same as it was when you created humanity and placed them in the Garden of Eden for us to be, O oh God, in a relationship with you and fellow believers. That's how much you love us. Since the creation of Adam and Eve, you have wanted their descendants, us, to be one with you. Thank you for being a God who chooses us continually, each and every day, who guides us, fills us, loves us, cares for us, and gives us a way of knowing your presence and how to recognize the grace of your power and the awesomeness of your strength. Thank you for being a God who is so much wanting to be with us. Help us to return some of that love to you and share it with the world. In your son's precious and most holy name. Amen. Our scripture reading for this morning is found in the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 22, verses 1 through 14. Once more, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for, banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who've been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatted calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away. One to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, maltreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to the slaves, The wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out onto the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to his attendants, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called but few are chosen. May God add a blessing on the reading of his word today. There is a visual image of Jesus that I've had since I was a child, whether based on an actual picture I've seen or created in my own childhood imagination. It's an illustration of the phrase, gentle Savior. Jesus is sitting on a grassy hillside surrounding by children and lambs. It's a warm, fuzzy image of Christ and that is comforting and sweet. Although I'm sure that the reality of his times differed significantly from the image I had in my childhood mind. I believe that there were times when Jesus' life on earth that exuded the same sweetness and comfort. But there were times that it didn't. Why else would people draw images 
from the ancient period reflect that goodness in this present day and age. Our scripture passage takes place during the time of the triumphal entry to Jerusalem and the anointing by Mary as recorded in the Gospel of Matthew. It is sweet and comforting. But what happened after that are not the words that would describe Jesus. Jesus was in the final leg of his earthly mission. And no matter what he was about to face, being tested by the Pharisees, questioned by the disciples, spending hours giving the touch of healing to the multitudes, his resolve never weakened to fulfill his Father's plan for him. His approach was compassionate. It was adaptable to the time and the place of the needs that were presented to him. He was gentle when he needed to be gentle, direct when he needed to be direct. He waned philosophically when he needed people to think. And he was practical when they needed to, when he needed them to understand. And in all those circumstances, he was graceful to those who were before him. Both those who were there to soak up what he had to say and those who were finding a way to destroy it. But during that last week, where this passage takes place, his voiced message is very loud, it is rather succinct, and it has incredible clarity. Just because you have lived your entire lives as a person of God, to the people of the temple, you grew up and followed all the laws, to those of us in the church, those of you who have been in a holy place to be in God's presence your whole lives, just because you have been facing that and been part of that doesn't mean you have answered his invitation to enter the kingdom. It's kind of a reflection of that old phrase, you know, your talk talks and your walk talks, but your walk talks louder than your talk talks. Say that three times fast. It's a simple question. Do you live what you assembled to say you believe? Although each of the Gospels includes a period of teaching by Jesus during the last week of his life, it is here in Matthew. Jesus is speaking directly to certain issues using object lessons and most of all using his parables. The parable at the beginning of 22 follows a very busy chapter of chapter 21. He entered Jerusalem at the time of the Passover. He overturned the 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 tables of the money changers in the temple. He cursed the fig tree. He had an altercation with the temple officials as they questioned his authority and tells two parables to make the point loud and clear that those who are questioning him really shouldn't be. Excuse me. By verses 45 and 46, the chief priests and Pharisees have had enough. Perhaps it is my childhood imagination again, but when I read those verses, I imagine that the chief priests and the Pharisees are blowing their tops like Yosemite Sam and the old cartoons when Sam was outsmarted, outmaneuvered, and outdone by Bugs Bunny. Yet like Yosemite Sam, the Pharisees begin looking for a way to get the best of Jesus. But they're afraid of what the people around would think of them. As a transition pastor, there has been times when I ask the right question or threaten the right sacred cow, and members of the congregation have plotted to take my, make my time as short as possible in their presence, the pulpit, and the position of the shepherd. When I would see the writing on the wall, I would begin to pack up my office, let the, nom- let the denominational bigwigs in Lansing know what's going on, and begin to look for a new opportunity after a time of debriefing and healing. I shied away. Jesus doesn't. Jesus doesn't shy away. He doesn't keep looking for other options. He keeps on preaching. He keeps on sharing this story found in our passage today. And it's enough to push the Pharisees right over the edge from wishing they could get rid of him to planning their trap. 
Jesus preached in such a way that the masses could immediately relate. Even as he shared new ideas, applications, and theology, Jesus framed them in stories of everyday life that everyone could understand. And with that being said, viewing these stories from the outside of that culture, and 2,000 years, 2000 years later, we can be a little confused, lost, and kind of say, what's the big deal? The story of the wedding banquet is an image of the kingdom of God being brought forth by his son, Jesus the Christ. In the parable, a king has prepared a wedding banquet for his son, and when it was prepared, he sent out his servants to alert the invited guests that the feast was ready. He issued a call. And the people who had been waiting for it, who had been looking forward to it, who had been invited years ahead of time, who had been told that this was going to take place, they paid no attention. And while a couple of them went on with what they were doing, the majority chose to deceive the servants and killed them. Sending a message to the king, yeah, you're not right. This, of course, enraged the king who sent out his army, destroyed the murderers, and burned their cities. He destroyed the very thing that they held dear. This story suggests a very powerful and real lesson. On the surface, if a king invites you as a guest, then you come when they call. If God calls you to engage in his plan and it interrupts what you are doing, you answer the call. How many times in the scriptures did Jesus say, come, be part of my people, and a person would say, no, 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 I got to do this first. No, no, I can't let go of this that I hold so dear. No, no, that's not the image that I had in mind to follow you. How often do we reflect on that in the Gospels? How often do we do that in our own lives? You're standing there at the grocery store. You're wanting to start putting together a menu that's more healthy. And instead of buying the fat-free, low-calorie stuff, you get the stuff loaded with all the ooey-gooey that makes your body go, oh, that's good. Even though there's nothing inherently good for you contained within. I did that just last night as I went to one of the unhealthiest burger places near my house, five guys, and felt my body go, yeah, and get heard my doctor saying, so are you working on your cholesterol, Paul? What about when God says, I need you to step out your comfort zone? I'm calling you on a new journey. I'm calling you to engage new ideas. I'm calling you to take what you've known and what you've believed your entire life and put it aside and just follow me. That's the scenario Jesus is in. Because the chief priests and the Pharisees would listen to every word they would say. Think of them as like the ultimate church council who not, know not every word of the policy and procedure plan that we have backwards and forwards, but knew the scriptures better than the pastor. And God is saying, I'm going to turn you left. Well, left for me, left for you. When... Everything you know turns you right. We get angry. We get frustrated for the time and energy that we put and invested to make these things come to pass. Not just in recent events, but things that we've held on to our whole lives from our childhood. I imagine our blood will boil like that of the Pharisees sometimes. I know it does for me. My plan when I graduated seminary was to be a successful youth pastor until I hit my 40s. 
because by then I figured my son wouldn't want to deal with his old man as the youth pastor, and then I would probably move on and have a congregation of my own. Instead, my personal journey has been to go from one congregation as another, as an itinerant guy who does the same thing over and over again. Take churches from where they're stuck and get them on the path so they can flow freely with the Spirit and each other. And there are days when I think selling insurance would be a much better option. (laughs) Because the path that I have before me, that I've answered the call to, there are days it is very, very, very hard to see the victories. But then there are days in our Christian faith when it is very, very hard to see the victories. When we have crisis and breakdown happen all the time, and you sit there and say, God, when, it, when is this going to end? And people give us the pop culture psychology that, well, God doesn't give you anything that you can't handle. I disagree with that. I think God challenges us more so we can lean on him more. He's constantly saying, here I am, but we say, just take it away, instead of saying, God, just handle my problems and help me to be okay with that. You see, it's a relinquishing of power that we have over where our lives will go and what will they result from. That's what God invites us to. That's what we're chosen to fulfill each and every day of our Christian journeys. And we can self-teach and self-promote as much as we like. But if you're not going in the same direction together, sure that God has anointed you to do so, then you're just spinning your circles and wasting energy. And when you stand before God and he says, well, I gave you my son, I gave you these gifts, I gave you these abilities, what did you do to grow the kingdom? And we go, I painted a nice wall and I gave money to this and, you know, I kept my grandchild from picking their nose in public. Um, How do those grow the kingdom? And that's God's plan. To grow his kingdom. To make sure that we are not the only ones who are in heaven, but the whole world that he created, all the people, join us. Are with us. Have you ever wondered how lonely paradise would be if this is all the people that made it? That's why we're called to go forth. Make disciples, teaching them all that Jesus has commanded us. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And obeying everything that he puts before us. That is a paradigm. That is an idea of putting God first and all the other things of the human world beside that the Pharisees had lived because they'd taken the laws and added on to them and added on to them, made these structures and ways that life should be, and Jesus was going, are you sure about that? Because I don't remember my father taking his law and dividing it down to the lowest common denominator, to the greatest element of detail. The Ten Commandments were designed for us to live in a life where we are in harmony with God, with God being first. But the Pharisees had made a rather lucrative industry out of using the laws to line their pockets, keep themselves at a level of elitism, and everyone else under their shoe or sandal in this case. How often do we do the same thing? I know there's people that I've looked down on in my lifetime because I didn't think they were good enough or worthy. (laughs) Woe to me. There's sometimes placed in situations that I'd like to do anything else but, but that's where God placed me.
It's not easy. But it is when we fully accept and follow God's calling. When he's chosen us to go wherever, whatever, however, even if it's to stand still for a while and just knock on the sky. Familiar with that term? It means to be still and not worry about how the bill's going to get paid. That your butt's falling asleep because the chair's too uncomfortable. That the bug is flying around your ear and annoying you. It is to sit and just be one with the Spirit and to lock out everything else. And I'll tell you from experience that when we do that, you're actually able to hear and see how the Spirit is moving more clearly, more intentionally, and the place where you get to step up and be part of it because we've been chosen. Chosen by God through his son who he sent into the world to save the world. Yes, sometimes we will be in conflict and opposition to friends and loved ones once we say yes to Jesus. But how many more people are waiting to be part of us in the kingdom, both here in this world and in the next? I can't comprehend it sometimes. But then again, I don't have to. I just have to follow. I just have to trust that what God is saying to me is genuine and true and what I need to hear in that moment. The blood of the Pharisees boiled. And aside from the end of the world aspect of Jesus' parable. There is a clear reference of those who believe that they were chosen by God. In this case, it was the Pharisees, the Jews, who he chose out of all the other populations of the earth. We sit there and say we are chosen because we have accepted Jesus as our Savior. According to rabbinical literature, The Jewish tradition promoted that a belief that all of them were people of God. And all of them would enjoy a messianic banquet when they would transition from this life into the next. When God would come and restore his power on earth once and for all. They believed that Israel would be put on the top of the mountain and everyone would look up to them in awe and go, wow, aren't they cool? Aren't they amazing? I wish I could be like them. But they held the idea that if you haven't come unto us through the commandments, if you haven't given your life to God, if you haven't converted, then no. Stay down there where we can throw pebbles at you. They came to believe that it was their God-given birthright. No matter how many times God tried to change their minds through the prophets and the writings, they believed that they would be on top. You ever run into Christians who believe that because they got Christ in their lives, they're better than everyone else? About that time, there's an old country song that starts going through my head, you know, drop, kick him, Jesus, to the gold wealth of life. Um, because I don't read the scriptures as a thing to give us arrogance. We serve through broken humility. Because it's only through the power of the Spirit moving among us, anointed to us by the gift of Jesus Christ, sent to us by God, that we can truly do amazing things. But we never do it for our own ego. We never do it to make us feel good about ourselves. We do these things to glorify God. Israel was mistreated by many different cultures, conquered many different times. 
And now when they have the Son of God standing before them, who for the last three years has been going around inviting them to come back to the basics, to come back to understanding what God's really about, to put aside all the mandates and rules that they've embraced and just go into a simple, fundamental, day-by-day, breathe-in, breathe-out relationship with the divine, they refuse. They refused the invitation that had been given to them as God's chosen people. So God will use others. Those that we may not give the time of day. Those that we think we're better than. Those whom we believe that ain't all that. Whomever you would look beneath, down to, That's who God would use. In the church that I had in Connecticut, it was a predominantly Caribbean congregation. It was very unique that the pastor, me, was the only person there who would be of the Caucasian persuasion. I would look out and I would see people from Jamaica, Barbados, Trinidad, Tobago, one from India. They were all from the Caribbean. And while they would stand, sit there and talk to each other in Patois, the, short, uh, the shorthand language of the Caribbean, I would be standing there twiddling my thumbs because I had no idea what they were saying. We rented space in our church to a Hispanic congregation. The pastor and I would get together every once in a while, but we would have to have an interpreter there because he didn't speak English, and the only thing I know how to say in Spanish is, donde esta urbano? You know, where's the toilet? <laughs> Hey, it's a good thing to know. (laughs) But what I watched was how my congregation looked down on the Hispanics. And one day talking to a fellow colleague uh, who was much older than myself, he was getting ready to retire. I just said, you know, Bob, I don't get this. He said, it's a really sad thing, but even in our churches, we still have to stand on someone else's neck to feel superior. I said, doesn't that go with every, against everything that Jesus teaches us? And he says, bingo. We look for the things that divide us so we can be elevated. Instead of embracing the things that break us and humble us so we can join and be strengthened by the Spirit. You see, I believe that to be a Christian, God meets us wherever we are. If we're on the top floor of the skyscraper or we are two levels below the basement trying to dig our way up, God is there. And he's not merely showing up, but he's trying to bring us together. He desires that the presence of the kingdom be in our lives, regardless of our pedigree or our background or our feelings of entitlement, whether self-imposed or self-loathing. Whether you've been part of a church your entire life or you're just new to the faith, it doesn't matter. God is calling and choosing you to be part of his kingdom, part of his plan, part of his ministries, making him part of your life, our lives. There is a phrase, come as you are. I've heard it throughout my life as God's invitation to all of us. Come as we are. But we're not supposed to stay that way. We are to change. We are to grow. Call it being enlightened. Call it gathering wisdom. Call it taking a catalog of our brokenness. I don't care. We're going to let the Spirit to use any means necessary to weave us together into a beautiful, complex tapestry of gifts and strengths and abilities to grow the kingdom. The king in the parable chose the new guests based on nothing more than they were a status of warm bodies, but he had the expectation that they would come to the wedding banquet prepared for the wedding. Not just come and be what we've always been. 
the invitation of the king, the invitation of our Lord, expects us to change and grow. Yes, God wants us as we are. Imperfect sinners in an imperfect world. And when we accept that invitation, there are some things that we need to change to prepare ourselves for God's presence. Changing on someone else's terms is not a popular concept in our world. It is not what our culture teaches us. It says, change on your terms. Do it yourself. Sure, let someone have a little influence, but keep your power. And God is saying, no, I've chosen you. My yoke is light. Let me carry your burdens. Many of us are invited. How many of us will be chosen? It takes some self examination. And it takes intentional focus to be prepared, to see ourselves, to prepare ourselves, to embrace our God when he stands and reveals himself before us. And I know that it is possible. I've watched it not only in my life, but in the life of others to be able to handle the tragedies and the muck and the mire that the world drops on us and unexpected deaths. And to be able to sit there and give thanks to a God who allowed someone to be in our lives. Allowed us to have an opportunity we wouldn't ordinarily have. Be thankful for a crisis because it forces us to grow and change. And to sit there and say, okay, God, you want me to rest and be still for a little bit. That's exactly what I'll do. The only thing that is consistent within all of that is our God saying, my child, come. My child, come. My child, come. You are one of the chosen. It's up to us to accept the invitation. Will you pray with me, please? Loving God, we like the image of a gentle, graceful Savior. But we forget sometimes that in gentleness and in grace, we have to get slapped out of reality that we have created to see your glory. Help us not to be resentful, but to examine, to seek to understand, to watch you more than we knew you today, to grow in your grace, because we grow in our knowledge. So we not only can celebrate it in our lives, we can help others celebrate it in theirs as well. Continue to prepare us, to call us, to use us in sharing the, son, the love of your Son with those around us. We ask this in your Son's precious and holy name. Amen. This is not one of the more happy, uplifting messages of Jesus. It is a in-your-face, kick-in-the-pants, fundamental question. When God calls, do you answer? And if you answer, do you answer completely or do you answer conditionally? And if you answer conditionally, how do you expect to understand 
recognize and then share the full glory and mercies of a God who not only created you, but also calls you, empowers you, enables you. If you that question with clarity, how you can do that without giving everything to God, then you're a much smarter person than I am. Because according to the scriptures, I don't see how it's possible. We have to give the totality of ourselves to our God when he calls us. Short term, long term, medium term, I don't know. Whenever it happens. As you go from this place, as you take what you've heard, think about it. Pray about it. If the Spirit calls you to, apply some of it to your lives. But as you all go from this place, do not be afraid to let the world know that you are children of God. Go in grace. Be filled with his peace. Have a great week, everybody. Amen.